Good morning. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Greater Mount Calvary Baptist Church, uh, Boykin, Alabama, slash Bruton, Alabama. Um, we've been down uh, two Sundays in a row, so I'll be uploading uh, twice this week. Um, one sermon for myself and one for my, our co-pastor, uh, Reverend Brown. Um, I pray that all is well. Um, I want everyone to know that COVID numbers are still on the rise. If you're not vaccinated, uh, please pray about your situation and, and I implore you to get vaccinated if possible. Um, people are still dying. Um, you don't hear about it as much, but the numbers have actually gone up. Um, for you all that are praying about going back inside, please know that the numbers have uh, drastically increased and it's summertime. So as winter um, comes around, uh, the numbers are um, predicted to still go up. Um, please, uh, pastors, take good care of your congregation and make good decisions for them after praying about it. Um, it is not my place to tell you if you should or should not go in. I will just say this. Um, the church that God so ordained me to be the pastor of um, is still outside. Um, even though it's hot and we're sweating, um, the congregation is well. We have a, a transmitter that allows the microphone to go inside of the car um, so the congregation can keep their windows rolled up and their air on. Um, if you all uh, have my personal phone number, please give me a call and I will show you how to set this up. If not, you can YouTube it um, and it will show you all the things that you need to set this up at your own personal uh, parking lot service. But overall, um, we have been blessed at uh, Calvary. We pray that you're blessed in your uh, personal congregation. Um, I had an aunt that passed uh, since the last time we gathered. Um, please pray for the uh, Davis family. Um, also, um, my godmother's father passed, so please pray for the uh, Stallworth family. Um, others are still going through trying times, so I pray that you all keep them all uplifted in prayer as we get ready for our Sunday service. Thank you. Our Father, our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We forgive our debt and we forgive our debtors. Leave us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. O oh, Heavenly Father, we come and bow our heads and hold our hearts. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank the Lord for watching over us that we slept through the night last night and as we woke up this morning. As you woke us up this morning, O oh, Heavenly Father. We have a father, we just want to thank you for another brief today. We have a father, we want to pray for the man that's going to break the bread tonight this morning. We have a father, we want to pray for his family, his wife, and his children. We have a father, we want to pray for Mr. Brown and his family. Mr. Lady and his family. We have a father, we want to pray for all the deacons and trustees and everyone that's going to come sign my book. We have a father, we want to pray for all the church board to go in your name this morning. We have a father. We have a father. Pray for the one that's in the hospital, the one that's in the nurse home. Oh, Heavenly Father, I want to pray for the caretaker this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, I want to pray for the president and all of his strength this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. Pray for the one that's in the war zone this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, the one that's in flooded areas, we pray for them this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, that you take care of them and their families. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you. We can't say thank you enough. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to pray for the ones that are sick, that had a problem this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, whether it's cold, headaches, oh, Heavenly Father, some cancer, sugar, no matter what it is, oh, Heavenly Father, we know that you know their cases, oh, Heavenly Father, we know their problems. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to pray for them this morning, oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to pray for the children this morning. Continue to watch over them, oh Heavenly Father. Oh Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, down to all the generations who died for our sins so that we will have a way in order to make it in. And in your Son, Jesus Christ, name I pray. Amen. 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 As you listen to the words of the song, the songwriter questions, have they fallen on their, on their knees too late for the Lord to come and take care of them? 
And as I was listening to the song, I realized that all of us at some point feel like we're too late and have done too much for the Lord to show up for us. But I'm so glad to say that it's never too late as long as you have breath in your body. I'm so glad to say that every morning that God gives you another morning to say thank you, Lord. If you just call on his name, you don't even have to give the prerequisites of saying it's me, Lord. The Lord knows you from the tops of your head to the bottom of your feet. Whether you can fall on your knees or your knees has gotten too bad to get down. If you can just put your eyes toward the hills from which cometh your help. If you can somehow muster up the energy to say, Lord, give me you. Because see, all the Lord is waiting on is that moment that you open up on the inside and allow him in because he's been knocking on the door waiting on you to answer for a mighty long time. So to ask God, is it too late is foolishness because the God that I serve just wants me to show up with an humble heart. I don't have to be all the way clean. I just need an humble heart. I don't have to be through cussing. I just need an humble heart. I don't have to be through gossiping. I just have to have an humble heart. I don't have to be all the way clean just yet. I just need to have an humble heart. I don't have to tell him it's Wyatt. My wife doesn't have to say it's Kawanda DeMond. Doesn't have to call him by his name. All he has to do is look toward those hills. Our Father, which art in heaven, we come to you this day, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, and I'm going to speak on behalf of all the baptized believers with bowed head and the most humblest of hearts, Lord, just saying thank you, God. Thank you for another day to praise your name. Thank you, God. For another day on this side of the dirt. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that the last eulogy that was done didn't have my name at the end of it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that the last time that I gave benediction, I was able to open another sermon today, Lord. Thank you, God. That I'm the giver right now, Lord, as opposed to being the receiver. Thank you, God. That I'm the doctor in the sick room and not the sick person in the sick room. Thank you, God. You've been a good God to me, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows that my God is a good God. And my God will suffice in all situations. Thank you, God. See, sometimes I don't say it the way that I feel it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You've been mighty good to me, Lord. Omnipresent God, all-knowing God, all-seeing God. And even though you know my heart and you know the bad things that I think sometimes you bless me in spite of, thank you, God. You've been mighty good to not just me, but me and my family. Not just me and my family, but me and my church family. Not me and my church family, but the fools and the babies. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Been good to the folks that didn't have sense enough to say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Been good to the folks that had sense enough to say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Been good to the folks that thought about coming to church this morning. Thank you, God. Been good to the folks that still laying in the bed. Thank you, God. You brought a son up for all of us this morning. Thank you, God. You laid a S-S-O-N son down for all of us. Thank you, God. Lord, so between the S-O-N and the S-U-N, you've been a mighty good God to me. Thank you, God. From sun up to sun down, thank you, God. But what I love about you is you still a God when the sun seemingly has gone down. You took care of me last night, God. But I realize that the sun is up somewhere all the time. And the S-O-N has been gone in the ground for all of us all the time. You are a good God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are a traveling God. Thank you, God. Even though you separate the wheat and the tarry, Lord, I know I would have fell on tarry side, but you took care of both sides. Thank you, God. Everybody in the parking lot, thank the day wheat, Lord, but some of us out here tarry. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. If you didn't know what I meant right now, some of us just as full of hell. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And thank that we plagued by folks that's full of hell. Thank you, God. But we're the ones doing the plague, and thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. So right now, Lord, how about I not mess this prayer up by asking you for anything because you've been too good for me to ask for something. You done blessed me beyond my own measures. You done blessed me beyond my own intelligence. You done blessed me beyond my own finances. You done blessed me beyond my own giving. Lord, if you gave me what I deserved, Lord, have mercy. So I'm just going to say, thank you, Lord. One time for the Father, thank you, Lord. One time for the Son, thank you, Lord. One time for the Holy Ghost. My God, good God. My God, good God. 
I didn't know why the preacher used to say, good God, have mercy. Because God been a good God and he always has mercy. Good God, have mercy. If you will, turn with me to Acts 9. He said, but he didn't say amen. He don't know how to pray. I ain't through talking to God yet. When I get through talking, then I say amen. But since I'm still talking to God, I'm a... Boy, I don't know nothing. Acts 9, verse 13 through 15. My mom always says that I only read one verse, and she likes that. Well, I read whatever God tells me to read. The day of three verses. And I hope you like that. But the good thing about the word is, even if you don't like that, just keep listening. Just keep listening. If you think that boy too young and he don't know anything, that's fine. Just keep listening. The Lord brought you here today for a reason. That boy don't ever preach about nothing. That's all right. Just keep listening. Just keep listening. I used to wonder why preachers get upset if folks didn't like their sermon. And I realized it's because they thought it was their sermon. Acts 9, verse 13 through 15. And I'll be reading NIV because in parking lot service, I can't tell. If y'all done got any better as far as reading the Bible, I can't see your faces. I don't know how long it took you to get the Acts. I don't know if you was in the Old Testament or the New Testament, so it's best for me to stay in IV till we go back inside if that's all right with y'all. By the time we go back inside, though, Lord have mercy, I'll be some KJV ready folks, right? Wouldn't y'all think? There'll be some folks that I'll be able to read some KJV by then, right? Some old English. It reads, Lord, Ananias answer. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on his name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Amen. Close your Bibles, open your notebooks. So I, I realized from my mom that when preachers give out a text and then they give other verses through the Bible, some of y'all are trying to follow that preacher through the Bible and you miss the point of what the preacher is talking about. So just get out a notebook and write down the parts that you would have been looking up. And if you're going to look it up later, fine. If you're not going to look it up, just make sure that you hear whatever God has for you for driving out here today. Amen. Deacon Woods, if you can hear me at home, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that your family is well. Uh, I'll speak on our other members that are sick and shut in at the end. Sister Brazil, when I get to the end, you know I'm going to forget. Just wave your hand so I don't forget to talk about the sick and the shut in. If y'all ready, here we go. It's 1028. So I was blessed enough once in my life to buy one of them big trucks that them white boys drive. And that wasn't a racist statement. It's just they trucks are bigger than ours. They have these big mud tires on the side of them that stick out the side and the truck be so high you have to have a special step to get up in it. I was blessed once in my life to have one of those trucks. So one of my Caucasian friends, and if you don't know what Caucasian means, one of them white boys that I talked to, he told me it don't make no sense to have a mud truck that you don't never take in the mud. So I said, you know what boy, you is right. I crunk up my mud truck and I took my mud truck down to the old stage road. My uncle knows about the old stage. That's where he lives. And it's this little pass-through road that go through where Timothy made them used to live. Y'all don't know them. Don't worry about it. And on that road, it had just rained. It was plenty of mud. And man, we mudded it. It was mud all up on top of my truck. It was mud in the bed. It was mud up under there at the axle. It was mud in the fender wells. It was mud in the rim. It was mud on the backside of the rim. When we made it to the highway, you could hear mud clicking up underneath the truck. You could see mud getting thrown. So I said, I'm going to the car wash. So I took my big mud filled diesel truck down to the local car wash, the one that you drive through. They put you in that little track and it push you through and it clean you off. It took me a minute to get my truck lined up because you know it ain't made for no big truck. It made for them little old bitty cars. But I finally got my truck lined up and the guy said, how many washes do you want? I couldn't afford a whole bunch of washes, but I could afford one wash. He said that'll be $15. I swiped my car. I got my truck lined up to go through the mud wash. When I got right there, it was my turn. This little young boy walks out and he begs for me to let my wonder down. I let my wonder down and he says, I'm sorry to say so, but your truck is too dirty to go through the car wash. He said, you have too much mud 
to go through the car wash. You got so much mud on your truck, it might clog up the return vents on the car wash. You got so much mud on your truck, it would take too many of us to rinse it. You got so much mud on your truck, you gonna hold up the line. He said, if you don't mind, sir, will you please back your truck up and exit stage left? I sat there because I had swiped my card and once you done swiped your card, they don't give you your money back because your truck is too nasty. They figured you should have read the sign before you came through. So I gathered my little feelings together. It took me a minute, cause remember it took me a long time to line my truck up to get it in. And it took me twice as long to get it unlined to get it out. And as I pulled off to the side, I let my passenger wander down and I beg for the young boy to come back over. And he thought I was finna ask for my money back. I wasn't asking for my money back. I had a comment that I need to make. He said, yes, sir. I said, I didn't know you had to be clean to come to the car wash. Tyler, the sermon. I didn't know I had to be clean to come here. I didn't know I had to be clean to come here. I'm going to say that one more time. I didn't know that I had to already be clean to come here. All right. You know, being a newly saved person is hard. Because it's hard to find some folks that will let you go through the trials and tribulations of new salvation after they have already been saved. It's hard to find some church folks, a spiritual car wash, that won't turn you away saying that your spirit is too dirty to be here. It's hard to find a place that don't dig down through your past, pulling out every skeleton in your closet, trying to tell you why God ain't happy with the life that you live. Y'all, it's hard to be around saved folks when you just trying to turn your life over. It's hard to get out that, that pew and walk up to the front in front of all them eyes that's judging you and sit down in that chair and the preacher asks you some question that you know you lying about and folk lead to the left and lead to the right and tell all your business and tell how you should catch fire just from sitting in God's chair. Y'all, it's hard. Not hard to be saved, but hard to find some saved folks that will accept you just as you are. It ain't hard to find the Lord. It ain't hard to change over from who you used to be to who you trying to be. It's hard to find some folks that don't have amnesia about how their life used to be. It's hard to find a church that don't mind a dope head sitting in there praising the Lord. It's hard to find a church that won't let you come drunk. It's hard to come straight from the club and say that I love the Lord because somebody gonna tell about where you was but the only way they can tell it is they were there too, but we ain't getting into that. In Acts 9, if y'all don't mind, I'm not going to preach what most preachers preach. Most of the preachers preach about the Damascus Road. I'm going to go one step further than the Damascus Road today. In Acts 9, we find the change of Saul to Paul. We find that God has found him in his lowest moment and has decided that even in his lowest moment, he can use a treacherous rat like Saul, a murderous, conniving rat like Saul. He realizes that God himself can change anything and make anything worthy of coming into church and taking care of his people. God so touched him and changed him. And a lot of preachers preach that if the change was hard, but see all the change was was Saul opening up himself to the Lord and the Lord doing all the work. I'm here to say that my change wasn't hard. Saying that I want to love the Lord wasn't hard. Saying that I didn't want to be drunk no more, that wasn't hard. Saying that I didn't want to chase women no more, that wasn't hard. Saying that my knees was too bad to chase a woman anymore, that wasn't hard. What was hard was finding a deacon board that would accept me just as I am. What was hard was finding a mother board that would accept me just as I am. What was hard was to find one drunk that wouldn't talk about the fact that I was a drunk. That's what was hard. It was hard to find a church that was so saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost that they would accept a dirty, muddy guy like me. 
So in Acts 9, when you read up around the Damascus Road, change, that part went hard. But just God does this to all of this, all of us. I want y'all to listen to this. When you get down to around verse 12, God tells Saul that the change is great, but you got to join a church. Y'all listen to that. The change is great, but you have to join a church. See, a lot of people want to stop drinking, but don't want to go to AA. But you got to be around other folks that are going through the same thing that you're going through. So when things start going downhill, you got somebody that you can lean on. So the Lord said the change was great, but you got to find a church with some other folks that used to murder folks. You got to find a church with some other folks that used to cuss. You got to find a church with some other folks that used to gossip. You got to find a church with some other saved, sanctified sinners just like you. But y'all blowing y'all horn, but that's the hard part. Finding a church where they ain't going to talk about you. Finding a church that if you can't put nothing but change in the, in the tray, they ain't going to talk about you. Finding a church that talk about your dress being too short. Finding a church that say you still smell like weed. Finding a church that will accept you in your drunken state. Finding a church that accept you just as you are because they have so quickly forgotten they ain't always been where they are right now. It's hard joining safe folks, y'all. It's hard joining a safe folk because how quickly we forget what a bootlegger house is when we don't go there no more. But if we forget that the bootlegger house was built on our paychecks at some point in life. How quickly we forget about slipping and tipping when our legs get too, too crickety and get over in the wonder anymore. How quickly we forget what E and J stand for as time goes along. How quickly we forget that Paul Masson is a looker that we used to like. How quickly we forget that all of us got a crown royal bag stuffed somewhere full of change. Didn't nobody want to blow because they don't want to tell the pastor they got a crown royal bag full of change. And some of them ain't purple, some of their bags is green. That means that it's a new bag. They don't want to tell that though. But they want to talk about the fact that I still carry a crown roll bag. They want to talk about the fact that I know about Paul Masson. They want to talk about the fact that I know that E and J stand for Ellos and Julio Gallo. They want to talk about the fact that I know that Crown Roy is made in Canada and it was made for the Royal family and that's why the bag is purple. They want to talk about the fact that I know that Seagram Dream, the other word for it, is not a head. Pastor, you must be you used to be a drunk. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You just ain't blowing your horn. Wanna act like they don't know that Crown Raw come in seven different flavors now. Wanna know that they don't, that they don't tell nobody they like the caramel better than they like the apple. Don't wanna tell nobody that. Pastor, I don't drink none of that. I drink Crown Raw Black. Don't blow your horn, I know you. Some of y'all had a crown roll bag in your back seat and I saw it today, hey, amen. But the hard part is y'all, finding a church that would accept you because they know how it feels to have a crown roll bag in the back. Finding a church that will accept you because they know how it feels to park behind the little stove so don't nobody see the deacon going in. Finding a church well, it's all right if both of y'all catch eyes at each other in the casino and both of y'all in the room. Right in the church, then that's all right with the fact that you couldn't pay your tithe because you gave it all to the Creek Indians last night. You ain't got to blow, it's fine. In Acts 9, we find that Saul has been turned to Paul, and now he got to find a church. And I'm sure that when Saul left on his way to Damascus, he thought finding the church would be the easy part, but finding the Lord would be the hard part. But I'm sorry to say that it's the other way around. Finding the Lord is easy because the Lord will come to you and he will accept you just as you are. But going to some saved folks is hard because they don't want you to find them because you might tell what they doing. They don't want the newly converted crackhead at church because the crackhead might tell that you was at the crack house last night. They don't want the newly converted alcoholic coming to the church because he'll tell that you got a back door or that you go through the drive through to get your liquor. 
One step further or you go across the county line and all your look will come from Pensacola, Florida. So don't nobody see the fact that you drink because I don't buy my look and brew too many people tell my business. I know I'm speaking to somebody today. I know I can't be the only one that has done all those things. I know I can't be the only one that was afraid to come to church because I see somebody that knew that I was doing some stuff that I ain't had no business and they wouldn't accept me. Wife, I can't be the only one here that done had the church turn his back on me because they didn't feel like I was good enough to be there. Wife, I can't be the only one that still cuffs a little bit. I can't be the only one that still makes some bad thoughts every now and then. It can't just be me. But God told Saul, he said, now you got to find you a church, boy. So what I like about God is he don't send you to a church without first talking to the church and getting them ready for you. So God called the leader of the church, Ananias. And he said, Ananias, he said, I'm sending a scoundrel your way, but I've been working on him. I'm sending a scoundrel your way. I've been putting a sermon down in his heart. I'm sending a scoundrel your way. He said, and, and I need you to take him in and do the best you can with him. And Ananias whispered to the Lord. He whispered. He leaned over. He said, Lord, you must not know this guy. Lord, you must not know the past that he had. Lord, you must not know what kind of guy this is. Y'all, and when I first joined the church, I felt like the Lord had to be sitting next to some of the deaconesses in the church. Because they kept leaning over, whispering my past to the person that was beside them. They kept leaning over, telling folk who my daddy was. They kept leaning over, talking about what they remember I used to do when I was 17. They started leaning over, talking about how I used to do this and I used to do that. Wasn't nobody talking about it except them into the church. Didn't nobody come and lay no healing hands on me. Didn't nobody pray for me. All they did was talk about me. I didn't know I had to be clean to come to church. I didn't know that I already had to be washed lily white before I came to church. I wasn't expecting nobody to talk bad about me at the church. I wasn't expecting nobody to think that I had it all together when I came to church. I didn't know that to be a preacher I had to be perfect. I didn't know that to be a preacher I had to have it all lined up. Nobody told me. Y'all blowing your horns. Have you ever wondered why I took the vote? while I took the boat out of people joining the church because I used to see y'all leaning over talking about folks past trying to decide if you were going to vote them into the church or not. And my fear was because I'm a very I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very honest person. If I got to vote somebody in, then that means that gives me the right if you ain't right to vote you out. And I ain't want nobody to get on the voted out committee because we wouldn't have nobody at church and we'll wait on all the perfect vote to show up. And what I do is I say, you voted out, 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 I'm sorry. You voted out, you voted out. You've been good in church, but you still a sinner. Voted out, voted out, voted out, voted out. And then I'm going to do like the mega churches do. And even though you voted out, please send your tithes and your offering to the Greater Mount Calvary Cash App. But Ananias couldn't see that Saul had changed because he was looking at his past instead of looking at his right now. When folks come to join this church, I don't want y'all looking at what they did. I want you to start looking at that right now. I don't want you whispering in nobody's ear, telling them about who they done slept with or who they done chased or who they done cussed or who they done cut or how many baby daddies they got. Oh, that child white and that one black and that one Indian. We can see that. I don't need you to point that out for me. I know how many folks they done slept with. But better yet, the Lord knows how many folks they done slept with. And if the Lord thought enough of them to wake them up this morning and start them on their way, who am I to stop them in their tracks? But I didn't know that part of the church rules was you had to be clean before you could sit in the chair. So as Ananias finally accepted him, and sometimes it's a little easier for preachers and, and than it is for the, for the pew folk. Because at the end of the day, the preacher know what he do in the dark and he real honest with himself. I'm real honest about who I am. Mr. Preston, tell him, I'm very honest with you about who I am. I'll tell you in a minute, if you catch me on the wrong day, ain't no telling what might happen. But see, 
Calvary as a whole is not honest with itself. Somewhere along the way, y'all started thinking that you were perfect. You were starting to think how pastor didn't see you, it didn't happen. But I know that your first and your second child got three different last names. I'm okay with that. The Calvary, for whatever reason, don't seem to be okay with that. As we go down through the text, we see that Saul go to try to join the church. And it says that God sent him to a group of disciples. Back then, that would have been the deacon board. And he was in there, and he was working on his trial sermon. And before he could get his trial sermon preached good, they had started talking about him. And I don't know if y'all have ever been a part of a trial sermon, but when somebody preaching their trial sermon, everybody in the audience talking about the trial sermon and how that boy don't know how to put an adjective and a verb together. And he don't know when to start and how to finish. And Lord, he didn't put Jesus on the cross. Everybody want to talk about you where you are. But you have to understand when first, when folks first get started, they are new at this. They don't know all the rules of coming to Calvary. They knew at this. They don't know exactly what they need to wear. They knew at this. They don't know that they got to have a church wig and a club wig. They knew at this. They don't know that you got to take a bath in something that'll wash the weed off before you come. They knew at this. They don't know that you can't sleep with somebody in the church and don't think somebody going to find out about it. They knew at this. The horn blowing going down here fast, ain't it? Dead. But they started to talk about Saul. They started to talk about how he was a scoundrel. They started to talk about how his subject verb wasn't agreeing. They started to talk about how he had double negatives in his sermon. They started to talk about how he used to want to be a killer. They talked about how he used to be a man for the king. They started to talk about everything but the fact that he had been changed. So two weeks after I went to the car wash, I had a birthday party and my daddy gave me, my daddy gave me a gift card to the car wash. He gave me a gift card that was for that month, you know, unlimited washes. You know, you swipe for $30 and you can go through as many times as you want during the month. And so I went back down there because I hadn't had a car wash since the last time they sent me away because it took so much for me to get down, and I was so hurt by the way that they treated me that I had decided that I wasn't going to go again. But my daddy told me that since he was going to give me the gift of unlimited washings that I need to at least go back one more time and try them. So I went back down to the car wash, and this time I had a little strip so I didn't have to wait on nobody to weigh me, and I just drove right in. And when I, I knew a little better this time how to get lined up based on the last time. So it didn't take me as long to get my car lined up. And when I got there, the little boy, he waited for me to let my wonder down. And I did, and I had a smile on my face because I knew what he was going to say. He said, sir, I'm sorry to tell you, but your car is too dirty still. You're going to have to back out and go out the other way. I said, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. See, last time I had a single wash. I only paid $15. But if you read your sign, if you got unlimited washings, it doesn't matter how dirty your truck is. I said, if you have unlimited washings, you just keep going through until you get it clean. If I go through the first time, there's a little mud on the top, I just swing back around and go back through again. I said, see what I need you to do, young man, is stop worrying about how dirty I am and start working on getting this car clean. I need you to start spraying on the front, and then I need you to spray in the back, and I'm going to let the wonder dive. I want you to see there's some mud on the inside, too. And when I swing back around, I want you to pull the flow mass out, and I want you to spray Spray them down real good. He said, sir, but what you don't understand is, I'm sure that going through one time ain't going to get this church clean. I said, sir, you are not listening to me. My dad gave me the gift of unlimited washing. He said, as long as I line up to come through, you're going to wash me. My dad said, and if I come out the other end and I'm still dirty and I got gas enough in my truck to drive back around, my daddy said, it don't matter how dirty I am, you gonna wash me. 
my daddy said, it don't matter if the seats are dirty, you better jump up in here and watch that too. My daddy said, and as long as I can crank this old truck up and get it lined up every day, you gonna watch me. That's how I feel when I come to Calvary. It took all I could to get lined up to come to church. Y'all gonna stop talking about how dirty I am. Somebody out there better help wash me. Somebody better be praying for me. My daddy gave me unlimited washings. If I ain't get washed this Sunday, help me out on Wednesday. If I ain't get washed this Sunday, help me out in Piggly Wiggly. If I ain't get washed this Sunday, I'm gonna just keep going around and around. Wash the weed off me, Lord, and around. Wash the lip off me and around. Wash the fornication and around. Unlimited washings. I ain't know I had to be clean to go to the car wash. I ain't know that. But once I figured out that if you get your daddy to buy you unlimited washes, it don't matter if you get all the way clean the first time. You just keep swinging that thing around and around and around. Talk about me all that you want. I don't care. Yeah, I knew I was dirty when I came here. And around. I closed right here. So when I went back to the car wash the second time, it was a real long line, real long line. I had to wait a while to get there to my time. And when I was talking to the guy, when I came back around for my second washing, because he was right, I did get completely clean the third time. So when I came back for my second washing, I rolled my window down and I said, sir, I said, since you have to be clean to come here, why were there so many cars in the line? He said, oh, they come all the time. They look a little better than you do because they come to the wash more often. But the first time they came, they was dirty too. I need some folks to get an unlimited washing here, Cal. Don't worry about what the folks say at the door. Don't worry about what the ushers say. Don't worry about what the deacons say. Don't worry about what the pastors say. You coming to get washed, lily white clean. Some of y'all are a little dirty than other ones. Some of y'all got some stuff down on the inside. Some stuff, some of y'all got some stuff in the bed of your trunk. Some of the stuff all up in the from the well. Some of y'all dirty all on the inside and need your floor mats washed off. Some of y'all, as they say, real dirty. Unlimited washes. That means that if you gotta come three times on Monday, it's all right, it's already covered. That means if you gotta come three times on Tuesday, it's all right, you already covered. You got to come three times on Wednesday. It's fine. It's all right. It's already paid for. Because my father went up to Yonder's Cross after coming down through four and two generations to make sure that I had unlimited watch. He hung on Yonder's Cross and shed bright red blood so I could be washed lily white clean because he knew that just regular water wouldn't clean a dirty soul like mine. And as my pastor used to say, he died, good God Almighty, he died. But early. Sunday morning, and he got up with all power, power enough to wash a wretched man like me, power enough to wash out my fender well, power enough to wash out old black and hard like mine, power enough to wash the alcohol, the weed out my system, power enough to take the dice out my hand, power enough to make me stay at home with my wife and not chase no other woman. I pray that y'all got the gist of this thing. Because see, it's only a few people out there that feel bad because Calvary won't let them in. Most of the folks in the parking lot are already at Calvary. But I'll say this, don't find yourself in hell being too saved. Don't be at the car wash turning away business when the folks out there got dirty cars that need washing talking about it's too dirty for your wash. Y'all, we got all type of water inside of Calvary. So much water that it rinse out in the parking lot every Sunday to wash some folks. So much water that it run out in barking and change some folks across the radio station. So much water that some folks record it on YouTube and play it all up in New York City. We got so much water that we'll clean you wherever you are. Because I know how it feels to be a drunk. I know how it feels to be so dirty that a church won't let you in. I know how it feels for both to be talking about you on your trial sermon. I know how I feel for folks to talk about you after you got your first church. I know how I feel for your members to talk about you, talk about he ain't all what he say he is. The good news is, you don't have to do the washing. All you gotta do is not hinder me from getting to the wash. 
I don't need one person in this audience to wash me. I just need to make sure that you don't stop me from getting my wash. Don't talk so bad about me that I don't feel good about being washed at the same place you was washed at. Don't talk so bad about me that I don't want to come back here no more. Amen. Calls on.